Okay. I'm going to start slowly. The, the, the speakers during this course are, are measuring the number of people sleeping during the courses versus the time of the week <laughs> to see how, how much you can take, you know? So next time maybe we'll do seven hours or eight hours a day if, if you don't sleep yet. Is everyone here? Almost? Okay, so um, um, I, will, I will begin by uh, repeating what I said yesterday rapidly about acoustics in non-reacting flows, and then we'll start you know, with the, the heart of the problem, which is acoustics uh, in, uh, combust in combustors. So remember yesterday I told you that you can take the Euler equation, linearize them, obtain the linearized equations, leading to a wave equation, which has two solutions in 1D, a wave going this way, a wave going the other way. I showed you that uh, the signals are convected, and uh, I connected that to what I said about the dissipation and the dispersion of uh, numerical schemes. And uh, then I combined these two equations to talk about the energy equation, the acoustic energy equation, this guy here. And I showed you that this acoustic energy, which is here in this room, for example, changes only because of the fluxes which are here, P prime, U prime, the product of the oscillation of pressure by the oscillation of velocity. And there's a zero here, except if you introduce viscosity in the problem. And so that uh, I told you that uh, that proves that basically most codes should not converge if you don't do what you should at the outlet here. And uh, the reason why ones converge fast is because they use a very large turbulent viscosity. And by the way, you see also the link here with what I've said yesterday is that the fact that in a ones code, this term is very large and dissipates acoustic waves is due to the fact that you have modeled turbulence like a viscosity. If we would have modeled it like something else, something which conserves energy, for example, we wouldn't have this problem. It's really the fact that you have put this very large turbulent viscosity which leads this thing to, to zero. Okay, so that, that was uh, the easy part. So let's start talking now about combustion. So now this uh, derivation about the acoustic energy, I'm going to repeat it now. But instead of saying that the flow is non-reacting, I'm going to say that now it is reacting. So now, this is the two equations we had before. I will do the derivation in 1D, but you can write it in 3D, it's just the same. Uh, now we need to add one equation. In the previous derivations, I said it's isentropic. Because in this room, for example, the flow is isentropic, but in a reacting flow, of course, it's not isentropic, so you need the temperature equation. And we're going to do the same exercise, take these two equations, linearize them, and see what we get. So you say that the density is a mean value plus rho prime. The pressure is the mean pressure plus P prime, temperature plus T prime. And you, again, we're going to say the Mach number for the moment, the mean Mach number, typically in this room again, is zero. So when you linearize the two equations, continuity and momentum, you find the same thing you had before. We have dropped here the terms which are of higher order, because you expect U prime to be small. So if you have a product U prime multiplied by something else, P prime, for example, we just let it go. And uh, here there is no mean convection term because we said that the Mach was zero. So continuity, momentum, <coughs> the unknowns here are rho prime, U prime, and P prime. So we need a third equation, that's the temperature equation here, which is linearized this way. And uh, this is the linearization of the state equation. <coughs> you take all these equations, you combine them. That means you express the derivative of rho prime as a P prime and the heat release. You see, if the flow would be isentropic, this would be zero. Now we have to add the perturbation of heat release. And you can combine all of them to obtain this equation. Again, you multiply the first by P prime, the second by U prime, you obtain this equation. This equation is exactly the same we had uh, a few minutes ago, except now it has a source term. Okay? So it, it tells you something. It tells you that the uh, acoustic energy changes now because of two phenomena. One of them is the fluxes on the boundaries, and the other one is the the term here, which you recognize as a product of two things, <coughs> the unsteady pressure locally and the unsteady reaction rate. All the primes are related to perturbations. Okay? Those are not mean values. <coughs> so you see that uh, in a reacting flow now, in general, 
this acoustic energy equation tells you that the acoustic energy can grow. And it grows exactly like the, the pendulum I've described you know, yesterday. In the pendulum, the question for the energy to grow was to know whether the force and the velocity were in phase. Now, in a reacting flow, the acoustic energy will grow if the pressure and the heat release are in phase. In other words, if you take a flame <coughs> and you have this idea <coughs> for the flame to dissipate or to create heat release at a moment where the pressure also is large, you will promote instabilities. Now, you can integrate this equation over uh, the whole size of the domain, and you will find that the total acoustic energy in the box will depend on this source term here, which is the integral of omega prime by p prime dv, integrated over the whole domain. In a combustor in general, and especially for thermoacoustics, not all points of the flame are actually exciting the mode. They are points which are exciting the mode, and points which damn the energy. The main question is the final average of those things, who is winning? the points which are damping the instability or the points which are winning. And this is why you need to integrate over the whole domain. Now, this is a very famous criterion called the Rayleigh criterion. Uh, the Rayleigh criterion was derived uh, 150 years ago, and it was not written, you know, it was written in the English uh, of that time. But if you read it, uh, uh, heat be given to the air at the moment of greatest condensation means heat release taking place in phase with pressure okay, fluctuations. Then the vibration is encouraged. Okay, and vice versa. So the Rayleigh criterion is really the basis in some acoustics. You, anyone writing a thesis on some acoustics will put the Rayleigh criterion in its introduction. Uh, and uh, it's a useful uh, tool, but you will see that if you use only the Rayleigh criterion, you won't go very far. Now, <coughs> uh, the acoustic waves which are created by combustion are not necessarily a problem. When they don't couple with the turbulent flow, uh, they just make noise. So if you take, for example, a pressure spectrum for what I will call a stable turbulent combustion case, you will have the, the minus 5 third here that you recognize, and you will have something that we call broadband combustion. When you say something is broadband, it means there is no sharp peaks on it. Because now if the flow gets coupled with the instability, then you start seeing a spectrum like that one. So you have peaks here. You can have one peak plus harmonics, or you can have multiple peaks at different frequency. Uh, each of these peaks is one unstable mode, one thermoacoustic mode. And when you have a peak like that, usually it's a big problem. So let me just give you some order of magnitudes of what we're talking about here. These things really shake, okay? That's when the combustion instability starts in the burner. Um, usually, as I said yesterday, the burner can explode uh, or you ca it can vibrate so much you have to stop it. So those are very large amplitudes. So you can estimate the amplitude of velocity, for example, from what I've just said before. It's always related to the amplitude of fluctuation. Those should be p prime, by the way. u prime equal p prime over rho c. Uh, the order of magnitude <coughs> is that if you know the pressure fluctuation, you divide it by rho c, density in sound speed, and you have an evaluation of the unsteady velocity. So typically, when you put a, a microphone in many uh, gas turbine chambers, and you measure the sound, you end up with levels which can go from 120 to 200 dB decibels. So no need to say that anyone would be dead in this chamber, not only because it was hot, but uh, mm. these levels here, it's not noise, OK? You, you, you would explode there. Uh, if you convert this dB to Pascal, you find that this is typically uh, 1,000 to 20,000 unsteady uh, Pascal of uh, vibration. You plug this number into this one, you find that uh, well, the velocity here created by acoustics, the fluctuations there, are of the order of 2 to 20 meters per second in the chamber. So that really means that uh, if you think about what the uh, flame speed is, which is 1 meter per second, 50 centimeters per second maybe, if you even think about the turbulent speed, no, U prime, U prime is of the order of uh, also 2 to 10, 20 meters per second maximum. So the acoustic velocities here are larger than any other speed in the system. So that means that we are not talking anymore about turbulent combustion. We should really talk about acoustic combustion, because the acoustic field is actually dominating everything. And so it's not a detail anymore. It's not you know, like you could say, I have a little bit of noise in this system, and I can forget about it. Once you go into these regimes, everything changes. So let me give you a few examples. That's, that's a, a nice paper that I wrote during my PhD. And that's, by the way, it's another theorem. Maybe it's important for you. A lot of people end up doing, doing their whole life what they did during the, their PhD. Maybe you did not realize that, but uh, 
Usually, you look at people do at 60, and uh, it's very close to what they did in their PhD. The main reason being that it's only the only moment where you can really work hard on one topic is during your PhD, so you should enjoy that, uh, because probably you're going to end up doing it for a long time. So this was a, uh, an experiment uh, in a turbulent frame where we would send air and propane here premixed. There are small holes here. There are 2D, there are slots, actually. And here you have a quartz window. You can look at the flame. <coughs> You look at the flame with your eyes, this is what you would see. A cold jet here with circulating gases on each side here. And here you have the zone where combustion takes place. And uh, as usually in this system, there should be, it should be symmetrical, but you see the jet here is going up a little bit. It's merging with its neighbor. Now, this flame, when you, you use a high-speed Schlieren system to look at it, it's how it looks. You have a high-speed turbulent jet here. Inside, you have non-reacting gases. Outside, you have hot gases. And the flame is stabilized by these huge recirculation zones here. As I said yesterday, you need recirculation zones to keep these things there. The speed here is about 50 meters per second. So this is uh, the, a 200 kilowatt system. It's already a, a reasonably big uh, system. Now, what's happening in this system is if you try again to try to optimize this thing, in this, in this case, you try to change the occurrence ratio. By the way, the flame changes. Instead of being what it was before, it becomes like this when you look at it. Like, and uh, the lifetime of the chamber becomes very small. All the walls become wet. And uh, basically, you have to stop the chamber after, after a few minutes, otherwise you kill it. This is uh, average over time. This is what your eyes would see. But if you do a Schlieren visualization of this flow, this is what you observe here. Instead of having this jet we had before, we see these very large mushrooms here, which are created in the flow. And uh, these mushrooms are created at the frequency that you hear. It's about 530 hertz. Now, uh, <coughs> of course, this is not a small perturbation of that, OK? The, as I said yesterday, this is now the limit cycle obtained. Uh, initially, when this thing started oscillating, it made probably small vortices. But now they are so big that they are using the whole space there. Of course, the flow doesn't stay like this, OK? It's, it's a cycle. So you create a small vortex in time. A little bit later, this thing gets larger, larger, interacting with its neighbor then disappearing, and then you come back here. And the whole thing takes place at 530 hertz, which is actually very close to an acoustic mode of the, of the combustor. And so that's one example, uh, a very simple one, where you just change something. You, the occurrence ratio, you change it by you know, one person. And this thing goes unstable right away. And, uh, and of course, this is the thing you are afraid of in a real engine. That's the, the thing you would not like to see. Another example I've shown also on the first day, uh, this one is uh, the, the, the Berkeley chamber. Uh, if I can find my mouse here, where is it? Um, as I said yesterday, this is uh, an example where you have here what we call turbulent stable combustion. And what I want to mention here is that when we go to this case here, I said for this case that you have flashback as you can see here. And now it's, you can understand why you have flashback. I mean, in those days, it's interesting to read the papers. They were thinking that maybe the boundary layer here was doing something funny. But today, we know that's not the boundary layer, which is the problem. It's really the acoustic velocity. I said that the acoustic velocity could be larger than the flame speed. It can be larger than the turbulent speed. And in this case, it's larger than the mean flow speed. OK? In other words, here, the acoustics are so strong that the flow is leaving the combustion chamber instead of entering the combustion chamber. And uh, of course, uh, this is not something you'd like to have, because uh, once the flame is where it shouldn't be, you, you have problems. Um, I want to show you now, yeah. if I can Up have the blue. sound, what it gives in a real chamber. Uh, if you go in the lab and you build a chamber which is designed to resist combustion instability, <laughs> And you just operate it. So the injection is here. The blue zones are typically the reaction zones. And what you're going to hear is directly the noise of the chamber. And you will see also the flame changes. Um, let me play it, and then I will probably play it again. Many things to, to see there. The, the first thing I want to mention is nothing is changed during this movie. It's the same occurrence ratio, same flow rate. It means that uh, basically you have two regimes here. One of them is not too noisy, the other one is clearly unstable. And the flame oscillates between the two regimes, which 
which is something that people studying thermoacoustics see all the time, is that the instability itself is unstable. It's not reliable that you will have it all the time. You can have it, then it stops, then it starts, and it stops. And I will show example tomorrow. Uh, this, this has a name in the world of physics. It's suggesting that you are close to bifurcation in the system, and that even the unstable mode is not stable. In this case, as you, can, as you have heard, every time the, the sound is changing, you see also the flame, which is changing. And if you would be able to do high-speed video here, you would see vortices here, very big vortices in this zone. And uh, that, uh, with your eyes, when you average, it means you see a flame here, and it goes away when the flame is more stable. Now, when your ears will be uh, uh, adjusted to some acoustics, you will also see something else in this movie. There are two frequencies there. There's a low frequency and there's a high frequency, like a pitch. This one is there, and the flame, uh, actually, you cannot have the two frequencies at the same time. Either the flame is looks like this one, it's, it looks stable, but it has this high frequency. And then when the low frequency begins, the high frequency disappears. Let me play that again. So now, this is an expensive game, okay? but you don't need to, to, to spend that much money to study some acoustics. You can do it at home. Uh, uh, you, you take any tube, and that's a classical system called the Ricoh tube. You have a, just a duct open at both ends, and here you put a, a flame or even an uh, electric system, which anything which can make produce heat. This system uh, can be unstable. So let me give you uh, an example. Uh, you, you go uh, to Safeway and you buy uh, something like this, probably just a small thing with a bottle of gas here and a flame at the top. And uh, this flame is uh, what we will call a burner in industry. Okay? A burner is a system which produces a flame. And as I said, a burner is not sufficient to do something useful for a flame. A flame must be in a box in a combustion chamber to, uh, to produce heat or to produce power. So the trick in combustion is that you always get two things marry, married. You marry a burner with a combustion chamber. So I'm going to show you the famous Poinceau combustion chambers, very sophisticated ones, as you can see. So it's just a tube. <laughs> and I'm going to put the previous burner into this chamber. Okay. And you can do that for $20. Um, so let me show you what this gives when you take uh, here this tube and this chamber. Happy. Simple. You basically just have the flow created by the flame going to the tube, and nothing much more is happening. If you take a long tube now, about the same. The noise changes a bit, but you know, in the end, it's almost the same. So then you take the medium sized tube. And you see here that something different. Okay. <laughs> when you do this, when you do a thesis on some acoustics, you lose a lot of friends in the lab. <laughs> only, uh, only, on, only the deaf ones keep coming. Uh, so what's happening inside now? So let me show you another movie. This one costs a little bit more because you need a transparent tube. And this one comes from Ecole Centrale in Paris. So when the flame is stable, you can see the flame here. It's another one. It's not exactly the same. But when you are in a tube which is stable, the only thing you see is nothing, basically. The flame moves a little bit. But when you are in an unstable case, this is what you see. Okay, the flame oscillates at the same frequency the, that you hear. And if it's really unstable, then you start seeing these uh, things here. And you recognize, actually, these mushrooms that we've seen before. And so this unsteady movement is created by the coupling of the flame with the, 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 the acoustics of the tube. Uh, <clears throat> just something I would like to, 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 to recall here is that in the movie I've shown, this tube is stable, this tube is stable, this tube is unstable. You go to industry, it's, it's really dangerous. It means if in year one you have taken your burner, sold it to a customer with this length, 
and it worked. Following year, you send it to a customer with this length, and it worked. The last year, when someone asks you for a tube in the in middle, you say, hey, I've done the big one, I've done the small one, I've done the middle one. <laughs> and when the guy says, you know, are you sure it's going to work? Are you ready to sign a contract saying you're going to pay me if it doesn't work to sign? Uh, and then you're dead. Okay. <laughs> Which really proves that in the field of thermoacoustics, simple ideas don't work. Okay. You should, should not you know, just believe that because these two guys are working, this one is going to work too. It's extremely dangerous. And lots of people are finding that out in practice. I mean, you need other tools if you want to be sure that your system works. So what are these tools? Well, this is where things get a little bit more complicated now. <coughs> so we need to find a way now, not only to study flames, but we need to put the acoustics into these studies. Okay? So of course, we already have problems to do flames without acoustics. So you can guess it's going to be more difficult with acoustics. So typically, I'm going to describe two classes of, tool, of tools. One of them is full CFD. So typically, DNS or LES. I won't even talk about ones for obvious reasons here. Uh, and the other way is to use what you call acoustic codes. And I'll, I'll come to that in a second. They are, uh, the problem with full CFD codes is that they are so expensive that uh, in certain cases, it's worth trying other methods. So let me, <coughs> let me show you how that's work, that works. Again, you can trust the Navier-Stokes equation. The compressible Navier-Stokes equations contain turbulence, as I said two days ago. They also contain acoustics. Nothing to add, just you need this to solve for it, but it's there. So if you take Navier-Stokes equation and you linearize only, you filter only the small scales of turbulence, you end up with compressible LES. This is the code I've been showing you in the last days. And uh, even so, it's an expensive way to do that. You, 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 we're going to use it. <coughs> but there's another way. Uh, the other way is to say, OK, um, all this show here has a very big component linked to acoustics. So why don't we do the same thing that people in the acoustic world do, which is freeze the flow, say the mean flow is not working, linearize the equations <coughs> around this mean position, and look only at the acoustic wave behavior, in which case we don't have to solve for everything here. We have something which is actually much faster. At that point also, I'd like to uh, <coughs> maybe to clarify a few things. If you, if you have been careful, you will have noticed that I've used the word linearization or filtering for turbulence and for acoustic. You, we, have, we have written this equation for u equal a mean value plus u prime when we are doing turbulence already. And now we do it for acoustic. I just want you to realize that this, uh, those are very different paths. Huh? Here, when you write this thing and you go to the LES world, you keep the nonlinear terms. This is exactly where you introduce the turbulent viscosity. While if you do acoustics, you drop all these terms because you say they are second order. Second order, I drop them. I keep only the first order terms. So this is a very different philosophy. Both cases, you do linearizations, uh, but not on the same term. <coughs> now, <coughs> in the turbulent world, uh, we will keep actually the nonlinear term and model them. In the acoustic world, we have dropped all these things. They are gone. The, the main difference also at the end is that the acoustic codes will work in the linear domain because you have linearized everything. So for example, you cannot talk about amplitudes. You don't know what the amplitude is in a linear code. It can be 10 times more, 10 times less. You don't know. You can solve them in the time domain. For example, TU Munich used to do that. Or you can solve them in the frequency domain. Uh, this is what we do uh, at Surfax. Actually, when you go this way, you can even simplify things much more. I will show examples probably tomorrow and even do it only by hand, uh, if you simplify things a little bit more. In some cases, it's useful. Now, of course, large AD simulation, they have this nice advantage that they can do everything. So typically, this is what I've shown yesterday, the growth of an unstable mode in a burner. You have just heard one, actually. The noise you were hearing every time you would, if you would plug the pressure, it would look like this. Uh, LES can do everything here. Yeah? Acoustic codes can do only the linear growth, which is here. Okay? It cannot, you cannot go there. But the nice thing about acoustic codes is that they should be able to tell you if a mode is stable or unstable. And in the end, this is what you really want. Because if the mode is unstable, uh, you don't want to have it. Uh, what you want to have is something which does not start. Once it starts, uh, industry is not so interested to know what's going to happen there. You know what the, the objective is, let's avoid that it starts. So it's interesting to work with acoustic codes here. <coughs> so the interesting thing about acoustic codes is where is the flame? Can you, can you do acoustics and keep the flame at the same time in your problem? Well, uh, at that point, you have to simplify things. The way uh, in which 
flames are incorporated into acoustic codes is what, what we call the flame transfer function. Uh, so the flame transfer function is this magical uh, function which will swallow all the information linked to convection and uh, combustion, vortex formation, chemistry, everything will be hidden here. Everything which is not acoustics, we're going to plug it here. So let me show you the idea here. This is typically the loop which you have in uh, combustion stability. You have a flow rate due to acoustics, which creates a vortex, which creates you know, unsteady combustion, that creates a new pressure wave, and everything which is blue is actually acoustics. Everything which is not blue is convection and uh, uh, reaction. So you can see here, for example, we're going to create this big vortex, which is here. It burns. Combustion stops, creates a new acoustic wave, and starts again. So basically, we're splitting this uh, phenomena in two. There will be an acoustic world in which we'll solve acoustics, and there will be a, com a com convection combustion world where we put all the rest. In the acoustic world, we'll basically keep only the blue parts. We're going to have a code able to handle acoustic waves, both directions. And uh, the only thing we need here <coughs> is the information about U prime, what does the perturbation of velocity do to the flame, and this will be taken care of in this box here, which is the flame transfer function. So here we need a way to measure or to compute <coughs> what the perturbation of velocity here does. It creates a vortex usually, which burns, and that creates a Q prime. And the Q prime will come back here directly in the pressure equation, and we'll show you how in a second. Uh, just to mention that this idea of splitting this world in two is really due to a guy called Croco, Luigi Croco. And Luigi Croco was at Princeton, actually, when he was doing that. And he came to France later. He was teaching at Ecole Centrale later. So uh, it's good that we talk about it while we are at Princeton. It's, uh, it's quite appropriate. Uh, so why does it, this help us? If you look at the solutions that we're going to use in the acoustic code, here you see we have uh, the heat release here, if, if you have a model for the heat release Q prime as a function of U prime, then this system is closed and you can completely forget that you are talking about flames. We have basically replaced flames by loudspeakers, okay? something which creates uh, a source term in the pressure equation. And the flames are gone now. Uh, you don't have to care about them. You just have to know what this transfer function is. You just have to know the link between Q prime and U prime in the combustor. So what does this FTF really measure? Well, actually, uh, it's, you, you remember the Shakira movie you know, a few days ago. Uh, you send acoustic waves here. It's a perturbation of velocity. And the flame just you know, waits. Uh, the flame just has a certain delay before it reacts. The way we measure the reaction of the flame is when the heat release goes up. So basically, you say boo to the flame. The flame waits, and then it says boo. And the time between these two boo is the delay of the flame transfer function. It's the time it takes for the flame to react to a perturbation. And n measures the strength of this response. If n is small, you don't have any combustion instability. In other words, if you take a combustion chamber, this is the way they should be built, actually. You take a combustion chamber, and you pulse the inlet. If the heat release does not change, you will never have any problem. It will always be stable. But in practice, it never happens. If you fluctuate the inlet velocity, certainly the flame is going to react to that. Your problem is to make it as limited as possible. Because otherwise, of course, if the reaction is strong, on the other hand, if N is strong, you know you're going to be uh, in a position where you can have problems. Now let me say also that this is written like N or N tau here. That those are the two variables in this equation. But it's a N of omega and tau of omega. It's actually a, a flame transfer function which depends on frequency. Um, and I mentioned that yesterday also. If you are sending a wave here at 10 kilohertz, the flame doesn't care. Okay? It won't feel it. The range of frequencies where flames are sensitive is typically from 10 hertz to 3 or 4,000 hertz. After that, just because of the, the characteristic thickness of flames, they don't see the highest frequency waves. You can forget about them. Which means that if you look at the literature and you look at the frequencies that you will find in combustion stabilities, you will find things between 20 and uh, 4,000 hertz. After that, nothing's happening. <coughs> so where we are now? Uh, I've been talking about this compressible LES method. I've been talking about acoustic codes. I have talked also about the Rayleigh criterion. And now to, uh, to, to
to go further, I need to, to you know, go into the details. So I will use these methods to show how things are working. And I want to sh start with the simplest example, which I did before, uh, which is the, the, re the, the Wicker tube. So this Rayleigh criterion, as I said, is in the introduction of all PhD students. Uh, but you can use it only in simple cases. Uh, and it's not really predictive. But still, there are cases when you can use it. It's useful because, again, it can provide solutions which are written by hand. And they are illuminating if you want to understand what's going on. Then these two things here are the tools which are used in practice. Uh, acoustic codes, for example, are uh, heavily used in industry. You go to companies like Alstom or Siemens, they have big teams, you know, not one guy, more than one, probably five or 10 guys. And they develop their in-house codes where they describe all the acoustics in their burner. Uh, there are good reasons for that. You know, they know it's critical to avoid having problems there. So this, these tools are heavily used in industry. And of course, now they start using LES, but the problem there, is, as you will see, is the price. So let me start with the, <coughs> the simplest case that you can do here. Rayleigh criterion in a system like this, can we do something by hand here? Well, actually, you can. <coughs> I used to, to, to give that as a homework for students, but I, I'm going to give you the solution right away. So you take a tube like this one. <coughs> First thing you do <coughs> is to derive, derive the, the, the shape and the frequency of the eigen mode of the system. And then, <coughs> supposing that uh, temperature is constant, for the moment that's sufficient, <coughs> we're going to suppose you put a flame somewhere and see when this flame will lead to instability. So for the moment, we'll suppose that you have a tube of uh, one meter length and 340 meters per second. So the first thing is to do some acoustics. So again, I apologize for those of you who uh, followed courses on acoustics. For the others, it may be interesting to see how it's done in practice. If you take a tube like that one without flame for the moment, and you ask yourself, what are the modes of that? How do you do it? Well, you say that uh, you use these uh, exact solutions I've presented at the beginning of my talk, saying that the solution of the linearized equation in a system like this are a wave going down, a wave going upstream. And uh, the general solution is a composition of these two. So the pressure will be written as a uh, a exponential i kx minus omega t, that's the wave going up. And the other one, minus kx minus omega t, the wave going down. And the velocity will be the same thing with the different sign. Remember that uh, the wave going down, p prime and u prime in phase. The wave going up, the, the p prime and u prime are out of phase. And the general solution is a composition where a and b are the unknowns. How do you find a and b? Well, you just have to write the bounding conditions. Here, the pressure is imposed. And here, the pressure is imposed too. Why is the pressure imposed, by the way? Well, uh, the pressure is imposed because you go into the atmosphere, and you're not going to change the atmospheric pressure by blowing into it. Okay? So you can say reasonably that p prime is 0 because p is constant. So if p is constant at both ends, it gives you right away a condition on a and b. At this end, you must have a equal to b. And at the other end, uh, since a is already equal to b, you must have sine kl equals 0. That's the resonant conditions. That means that you cannot have any frequency here. The frequency must correspond to the resonance frequency of the tube. So if you look at uh, what that means, really, it means that the wavelengths here of the mode must be two times at least, but it can be more than that. Four times would work too. Two times the length of the tube. So that means that if you have a mode here, it will look like this. You have one half, and then there would be another half on the top. So that really means that the length of the tube here is one half of the wavelength. So the wavelength must be 2L. That's what we call the half wave, half wave mode. Uh, if you compute the frequency of that, you find 170 hertz. In this system, you would also have the harmonics of that, so 340, etc., etc. If you plug this solution now in the shape for u prime and p prime, you end up saying that u prime has this shape here. It's a cos kx, cos omega t. And p prime is sine kx, cos omega t, plus pi over 2. And so everything is determined here. And as always, since we are in a linear world, A is unknown. It's the amplitude, but it can be anything. So the structure of this mode is the following. At one instant in time, you will find the pressure maximum here, or minimum here, maximum on the top. And there's a pressure node here where pressure never changes. And here, the velocity will look, the pressure will look like this. So this is the velocity. So pressure is zero at both ends because of the boundary conditions. And this signal will move from one side to the other. At the same time, the velocity will do like this. Okay. Now, uh, <coughs> this is uh, easy. So let's 
try to think now, if we don't modify the structure of this mode, what's happening if I put a flame here? I will locate the flame at a position x equal to a, and uh, I will just use the Rayleigh criterion, because here we can do that, uh, to find out if the flame is stable or not. So <coughs> if I put the flame at a over l equal 0.8, that means I put the flame on the top here, and I put a plot versus time the signals of velocity, this is this one, and pressure, using this simple formula, the two here, this is what you find. It looks like this, okay? Velocity and pressure. And if I put the flame on the lower part of the tube, this is how the signals look like. So for the moment, no big, no big deal here. But let's, let me add the flame now. I'm going to add the flame, and suppose that the flame delay, tau, is equal to 0.2 times the, the, the period of the system. That depends completely on combustion, okay? It depends on the flame that you're using. It, you can have a large range of delay. I'm going to just take one and use this model to compute the Rayleigh criterion. How do you compute the Rayleigh criterion? Here it's easy. If the flame is here, this is the velocity. And since I'm saying that the heat release is lagging behind the velocity by a delay tau, this has to be the heat release. Okay, so you start by the velocity, you add the delay, you, f you find the heat release, and then you wonder, is this stable or not? Well, it's stable if the heat release is in phase with the velocity. And in that case, there's a simple way to see that. You just multiply the two. So you create P prime multiplied by omega prime, and you find it's always negative. So you can say that at this point, for this condition, this system will be stable. Okay. Very simple way of looking at the problem. You can do the same thing here by putting the flame in the lower half of the tube. And here, you will find that uh, if this is the velocity, the heat release lagging by a time tau, you, measure, you construct the Rayleigh criterion, you find it's positive all the time, so it's actually always unstable. And here I've done two examples, but you can do the general case just by computing P prime multiplied by Q prime as a function of all the parameters you have, and you find that p prime q prime, the integral, has this expression. It's the square of the amplitude, sine 2kx, sine omega tau. This number is positive, so that means that if you want to have an instability, you need to have this. That means you need to put your flame in the lower part of the tube. And that's a classical result for the Ricke tube. If you have a tube like this, if you put the flame in the bottom part, it will be unstable. If you put it at the top part, it will be stable. A very simple experiment also that you can do at home if you want. So <coughs> does it mean that the old tubes will always oscillate? No, it will depend on how. You know, it depends on the flame that you use there. But in general, the possibility is there for the tube to oscillate. There's something I did not talk about also is the fluxes. The fluxes which are here at the end of the tube might be big enough to compensate for the gain that is here. And that's a very usual. Uh, methodology which is used in gas turbines or in many combustors is to add dampers. Since we know that combustion acts as a loudspeaker, which forces the flame to oscillate, you can say, okay, sure, you oscillate, but I'm going to take your acoustic energy at another place. For example, I can have a multi-perforated wall, which will act as a damper. I can have a damping system like a Helmholtz resonator, which I plug somewhere. I can try to have any kind of system which can kill acoustic wave, and that will help me to keep the system stable. So. <coughs> You can, with the Rayleigh system, you can do uh, uh, stability analysis in very simple configuration like this one. And uh, again, the, the one thing I want to remind you is that uh, uh, these systems are not uh, linear, okay? You have uh, sine waves everywhere. That means you can have systems which are stable, unstable, stable, as I've shown for this thing here, where you had tubes here which were uh, good, no good, good, and this is why industry uh, is interested in this problem, okay? because today it's a major issue. Okay, so let me go now to real problems. Uh, <coughs> the Ricke tube, anyone does it again, it's usually chapter number one in, uh, in PhD thesis on thermoacoustics. Now, what's happening if you go to uh, real systems? Well, if you go to real flames, to real flames, what are, we, what are you going to, to, to do about, uh, for example, the acoustics and uh, the flame transfer function? 
The first problem that you will have, even so you don't know it when you begin, is the, what you call the, the impedances. Impedances is just another word in acoustics for boundary conditions. So let me, let me show you that. The Ricoeur tube is a case where uh, the boundary conditions are actually simple. As I said, the pressure is imposed here, and the pressure is imposed at the top. That's cool in terms of acoustics, because uh, it has a direct translation in the acoustic world. But now let me show you the animal we're talking about. He's talking about this guy. Now this guy here, the combustion chamber, which is here, doesn't have an open atmosphere in front or in the back. In the front, you have a compressor. In the back, you have a turbine. And so now you have to say, well, I'm going to have to fix the boundary condition here at the outlet. What is it going to be? Well, let me show you one of these animals. This is where, uh, for example, we keep, now we start doing much more of these uh, computations here because they are the critical part. This is a, a, a turbine in that case. And you, you see here the blades. And uh, just let me show you the, how the, this is a computation again, how the flow field looks in the Sphinx. And our problem now is the following. Here's the combustion chamber. Uh, what is the acoustic condition here? The same way of thinking of this problem is to say, if an acoustic wave arrives here and hits this element, how much acoustic energy will come back? What will be the reflection coefficient? What will be the phase? When this was the atmosphere, it was easy, p prime equals 0. But here, it's much more complicated. So just a, a small movie here, which is not really an acoustic wave, but it shows you the complexity of what's happening when you send waves on a system which is turning. You see this wave arrive here, hitting the high pressure stator, then the water, and you see how this wave behaves. Uh, here you can look at the transmission of the wave. What you are interested in is to know how much energy would come back. If you don't know that, you cannot study some acoustics. So turbo machinery enters our problem. We didn't want to do that, but uh, if you want to do some acoustics, you need to worry about turbo machinery. As soon as you start talking about turbo machinery, you have to talk about uh, entropy waves. So I need to discuss a little bit those things. Uh, <coughs> acoustic waves, if you have a combustor and uh, you have unsteady combustion inside, you make noise. But it's not the only thing you do. You also do what we call entropy wave. What is an entropy wave? It's a hot spot due to the fact that the flame is not burning at a constant rate. If the flame is oscillating, you will have uh, an alternating uh, series of uh, hot spots, cold, hot, etc. When I say hot and cold, it can be you know, a difference of 400 K. Uh, it doesn't have to be completely cold. Uh, when there's an interesting behavior is that these entropy waves, uh, when they go through a nozzle, like the one you had in the turbo machine system, uh, they do uh, reflect and generate acoustic waves. And uh, there's a second effect also, of course, in the turbo machine system, is that you get rotation due to the veins, which adds uh, more acoustic problems. So I know you thought you were in a combustion school, and then by the way, you are in a aerodynamic school. But uh, it's, uh, it's what you need to do if you want to do some acoustics. So let me just show you an example. This is the simplest uh, turbo machine system you can imagine, just a nozzle. I'm going to send an acoustic wave there. And you're going to see that this acoustic wave just goes through. But when it reaches the nozzle, there is a reflection here. So you can see pressure oscillation, P plus and minus. And then you see when it hits the nozzle, you get an acoustic wave being reflected. We need to know for some acoustic problems, we need to know how much is coming back compared to how much was arriving on the nozzle. Now, in those combustors which are terminated by a nozzle, uh, we need to care also about the fact that uh, uh, the entropy modes will also do something funny in the nozzle. We've been, we know that there's a very good book actually by Kulik, re-edited in 2006, uh, which describes all that. And it's this mechanism I'm going to show is extremely important in ramjets and in rocket engines. Um, so let me just, instead of a long talk, show you an example. This is an entropy wave. So this is cold, hot, cold, hot. And this thing is propagating to the right. <coughs> and it will, when it will hit the, the nozzle, it will make noise. The noise will propagate in both directions. And by the way, for people used to acoustics, you recognize here that the wavelengths of the acoustic waves are much longer because they propagate at the sound speed. And this one propagates at the convection speed, so the wavelength is much smaller. Both of them have the same frequency, not the same wavelengths. So this mechanism here is important because in the real chamber, this is, this is an uh, helicopter combustion chamber. You see the temperature field. Here is the high pressure stator. And you see all these pockets here are warm, cold, colder, let's say, or less warm. When they hit the 
high pressure state, uh, they will make noise come back, and this noise can interact with the combustion chamber. So that means that we have to care about uh, the interaction between hot spots and, uh, and uh, the, the, the machinery, the turbo machinery system behind it. Does it want to do it or not? Doesn't want to. Well, it's the same picture, no problem. Okay, so that means that in addition to, uh, to uh, the, the scheme I've described before, where the loop was closed only by reaction rate, there are cases where you also need to add something. You need to add the entropy loop. So the acoustic world remains the same, but here, instead of having unsteady combustion generating directly a pressure wave, you can generate an entropy wave which goes to the nozzle and then generates a pressure wave. You can accommodate that in code. Uh, I will not talk about these things except if you're doing rocket engines and uh, ram jets. Normally, you don't care about this loop. It's a specific case that you can, you can forget in most cases, but not always. Let me give you an example, for example, where we found that we had to care about that. That's a, um, a gas turbine system. And this gas turbine is interesting. It's, uh, the problem which was brought to us was the following. It's, this system works except when it's raining. So, uh, and when it's raining, it's unstable. That's typically the kind of things you, you hear in industry. Okay? Uh, or it's working, but it doesn't work during winter. In winter, it gets unstable. So let me just show you what LES is saying here. These are two cases. One of them is warm. This is the inlet uh, temperature. And one of them is colder. And you see, indeed, that this is the pressure in the chamber. This one has very large pressure oscillations. And this one has almost no pressure oscillations. So this is the case where it's working. And then you, either because it's raining or because it's winter, you get a low inlet temperature, and then suddenly this thing gets unstable. And when it gets unstable, you recognize here entropy mode. You see this very hot zone here propagating to the nozzle. You don't see it here, but when it hits the nozzle, it sends a pressure wave back, and the whole system oscillates. So that's one example where entropy modes have to be taken into account. Normally, you don't have to do that. And you see, of course, that for this case, it does not happen. You don't have these big pockets hitting the nozzle. So that means, again, that uh, especially for those of you who are used to, uh, to uh, one's computations where you just specify pressure and uh, flow rate, if you want to do some more acoustics now, it gets more complicated. I said two days ago that if you want to do LES, you need to specify inlet turbulence explicitly. Now, if you want to do acoustics, you need to specify uh, also the acoustic bounding condition. That means you need to say what the impedances are. So what do impedances measure? They measure the ratio of P prime over U prime in a given section. Uh, it's, uh, it's something which is directly related to the reflection coefficient of waves. Uh, and it's the way acoustic codes actually uh, model uh, boundary conditions. So can you have these things? Well, you can, uh, except, of course, it's complicated. Here is the commercial chamber. Here's the outlet. Normally, this is where you stop your computation. This is the place where you want to impose the impedance. Same thing at the inlet coming from the compressor. This is the place where you want to know your impedance. How do you compute the impedances? Well, uh, it requires you to know all the stages here and all the pressure jumps, or all, uh, all the geometry, to, to be able to compute the impedances. And that today, it's really an unsolved problem. Let me show you examples where impedances are simple. There are a few of them. Not, unfortunately, not in gas turbines, but for example, in furnaces. There are cases, or in the lab especially, there are cases where you can be in good shape to do that. The first case is uh, if you have a wall. I mean, bad idea if it's, a, if it's a combustion chamber, you don't want to have a wall, but that's typically, uh, if this is an inlet of a combustion chamber, you're injecting the gases from the side, and here you have a wall. That means that if an acoustic wave comes here, it will hit the wall where U prime is imposed. So if U prime is imposed to zero, the impedance P prime over U prime will be infinite. That's one example where it's easy to have the impedance. Another example, if your flame is blowing into the atmosphere, as I said, the pressure is constant, P prime equals zero, the impedance will be zero. A usual problem we have, especially in the labs, is that people don't really do that. You, know, you don't like to have uh, your experiment blowing into the hole, especially if you're blowing uh, hot gases. So what many people do, especially at high pressure, they add another tube here in which they inject air, uh, they inject water, and then they have a second chimney, and then they have something else. And then, and then when you ask them what is the impedance, they have no idea what the impedance is. It's needed to, for safety reasons, but if you have a complex system here in the lab, you will have a complex impedance here. And that will control completely the results of the thermoacoustic problem. 
So every time you think thermoacoustics, right away you have to think impedance. Otherwise, you're not going to go anywhere. There's the last case, which is simple, which is if the tube here is infinitely long, you know, it goes forever. In the lab, it would mean, you know, like 10 meters, 20 meters, whatever. Well, in that case, the wave coming back is zero. There will be no reflection. And you can have then only uh, a wave propagating in that, this direction. And in that case, P prime over U prime, which correspond to what it is for a wave going right, that is rho C. And we use this system, actually, in, uh, in microphones on many combustion chambers. If you have a combustion chamber here, which is very warm, you cannot put the microphone like this here. So you put a very long tube like this, and you put your microphone here. And you know that the time it takes to go from here to th there is just the length divided by the sound speed. But you don't have to put your microphone in the hot gases. So if you look at an experiment uh, where people do some acoustics, you will see this kind of shape here. You will have the chamber with the flame here. And here on the side, you have this tube, which is usually wrapped around like this. Here we have like a five or six meters of small tube. And the microphone is installed here. And the idea is you can do that because the impedance here is rho C. And the time to go from here to there is known. It's just the propagation time. If you don't do that, if you just do this, and you put your microphone here, then uh, you will have resonances due to the, the fact that the acoustic waves will go both ways here. And that will uh, give you a wrong phase. So again, um, those of you who come from the combustion world and they want to touch some more acoustics, you should go take a course on acoustics. Huh? Otherwise, your life will be difficult. Uh, there's a last case where you can say, well, a few other cases where you can say things. For example, if the nozzle at the outlet is choked here, so if it's sonic, you know that sonic means, of course, of course, something for acoustics. If it's sonic, the acoustic wave cannot go through. So in that case, you can have methods derived by marble and, and candle at Caltech, uh, where you have ways to compute the, 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 the impedance. Another case which is useful in the lab is the following case where uh, you are feeding your combustion chamber. Here you have your flame. And at the inlet here, you put a choke nozzle. And so you expect the flow rate to be constant. If the flow rate is constant, its perturbation is 0. And you can express it as a function of p prime and u prime. And you find that p prime over u prime is just one, minus 1 over the Mach number. Uh, that's uh, about the only cases I know where you can have simple impedances. In the other cases, well, you're in trouble. You need to, uh, if you're doing a real engine, uh, you need to care about those things. It also shows why life is so different if you're working for industry or if you're working in the lab. In the lab, you will never have turbine or compressor. It's just too expensive to have anyway. So if you're working in the lab, you probably can get through with simple methods to get impedances. If you're working for industry and you're looking at this animal, uh, you're stuck. You have to worry about the impedances. One of the, of the consequences of that that we see very often is that if this burner is unstable here, in this case, and you, this is the, the errors which were made a few years ago, and you take the combustion chamber alone, bring it to a lab so they can test it, there will be no link between what they will see in the lab and what you see in the real engine, because the instabilities depend on, the, on what you put here. So it's not worth going to the lab to study the instability of this system alone. Normally, you should have the right impedance if you want to do that. Otherwise, you cannot compare. Now, in the lab, you can measure impedances. That's an example uh, from Ecole Centrale also here, where you, you have here a very special system to control the impedances. So how do you do that? You send acoustic wave. You look at the reflection you, with microphones. And you can construct either the impedance z or the reflection coefficient r. And the curves of impedance look like this. You know, Those are things that you can obtain in the lab. And this is the things you would like to have for turbine. Uh, here you have the frequency. Here you have the modulus of the reflection coefficient. And here you have the phase. And these things control uh, the stability of the system, ultimately. Okay? That's, you need to know them. Uh, just to repeat what I just said, the instabilities in this system, in this chamber, are not a function of this chamber only. They are a function of this chamber and of the impedances at both ends. And if you don't have them, you, you cannot predict stability or not. 
Okay, that was for the impedance part. That was to describe the behavior of acoustic waves at the extremities of the system. I haven't talked about the flame yet. So now I want to talk about the flame action, what we call the flame transfer function. So this is where we are now. Uh, we need to describe in acoustic codes how we're going to include the effect of flames. Before to doing that, I want to explain also something else here, which is that we have basically two different strategies now, numerically. Uh, when you face a problem of combustion stabilities, there are two ways of attacking the problem. One way is the, the rich lazy man method, which is the LES of everything. And the other way is the guy who tries to think about it, it's the acoustic code method. So let me just describe that uh, rapidly. Uh, forget entropy modes for the moment. This is the loop that we want to, to study, okay? The first method is to say, I take a code where I plug everything in and I compute everything. So typically, that's what we call the brute force method, self-excited LES. You mesh the whole chamber. There's this little trick here that you need to mesh it far enough that you know what uh, you can set as a bounding condition, if there is such a place. And then you just run the LES, and you see if it's stable or not. If it's stable, you can say probably the experiment is stable, and vice versa. And this is the example of the, the Alstom burner I've shown before. Uh, this one was unstable. Obviously, you can see it's not working the way it should. Instead of injecting and burning at the same time, it is injecting, then burning, injecting, burning. Not a good idea, OK? This is very unstable. And this is a self-excited LES. This is basically, uh, we couldn't dream of doing that you know, like even 10 years ago. Now we can do it. And the funny thing is, when you do it, it's say, well, OK, it's nice. Make, you can get nice papers. This is a JFM paper. Uh, but uh, the first thing is very expensive. Here, typically, a simulation like that, you have to count in, uh, in CPU years, typically 500 <coughs> CPU years to do something like this. Uh, 500 CPU years is a nice number. If you do it on 10,000 processors, it's only a few weeks, OK? Of course, we don't wait years for that. Again, if you have a big computer, it's not a problem. The problem we have with this thing is that uh, if you get the impedances wrong, uh, the result is wrong. And you need to wait you know, all this time just to, to find a result which is completely controlled by the impedances. So that's very unpleasant. And in the cases where it works, and we, you will see that tomorrow, uh, it's very funny because it will give actually the same result as the experiment, but it doesn't explain anything. It's just like an experiment uh, which is somewhat easier to use, not always easier because uh, there are problems also with simulations, but it does not tell you anything on the why it is unstable. It just tells you it is unstable. Okay. And now, but industry tells you, okay, well, how do you stop the instability? Ah, oh, well, that's another problem. I don't know. This is why we need to go to this. Uh, we started using the second method here always the same idea to cut the problem in pieces uh, and that you can analyze independently so that you can you know, say something, for example, about control. So we're going to separate, as I said, the acoustic loop from the non-acoustic uh, flame response. And I will show you how we couple these two. But first, we, we, we have a break. I guess it's time to have a break. So if you have a question, or you can, yeah? Uh, for the simple analysis, how do you usually determine the tau? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I will, yeah, the question is, how do you determine the, f the, the time response, tau, in all these methods? I will, I will, that's what I will describe later. But clearly, uh, finding tau is the difficult part. And uh, it's even more difficult because the influence of tau is very strong, and the uncertainties on tau are very large. And uh, I will talk about that extensively later. Yeah. I just wonder if you decouple the calculation with the acoustic with the AES. Is that a simple way to start? Please? You, you decouple the two, just solve it sequentially. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Here, really, you can, you, you, there is no coupling between the two. You can do things separately. I will explain that in, in a few seconds. Yeah. We don't have to, the question was, do we have to couple them? No, you don't have to couple them. You can do them sequentially. You had a question? Yeah. I was just going to ask, um, did you say that the entropy waves travel at the convection speed? Well, if, if, the, if the perturbation of heat release would travel exactly at the convection speed, it would be easy. In practice, you create vortices, and these vortices grow and travel at a speed which is, uh, depends on the, on the exact flow field. And then uh, the chemistry takes place also. You need some time for the combustion to burn. So tau is not only a convective delay. It combines delay of due to convection and heat release and uh, chemistry. <coughs> for example, if you take a fuel which burns faster, 
the delay will be shorter. Okay, it has to. Uh, when you're running areas, uh, are the boundary conditions Okay, I'm not sure if you if you see how far this is going. The, the, in the LES, there is a problem with the boundary conditions due to impedances. Is that the imp if the impedances are complex, that is complex numbers, it means they include a time delay. And if you think about a, work, a code working in the time domain, a time delay means that when a wave comes out, you have to store it somewhere, wait, and re-inject it after this delay. That's really difficult to do. So today, the status for LES is that we have a difficulty to incorporate realistic impedances at the end of the domain. It's a major problem, actually, for LES. How do we provide the impedances? You have to, <coughs> you can measure them to obtain the impedances, if you want to obtain impedances for a problem like this. Uh, if it's simple, you can uh, uh, evaluate them, as I've shown here, for simple cases. You can have formula for them. If it's more complicated, then you have to go to uh, measurements, or you have to go to the uh, acoustic theory. The uh, acoustic specialists can provide evaluation of impedances. But if you go to a gas turbine, then today I would say, uh, um, if, if you work for a company, Alstom, for example, and Siemens, they have measurements that they don't publish at all, because they know how critical it is, and they know how expensive it is. To measure the impedance of a gas turbine, you need to take a gas turbine, remove the combustion chamber, let the turbine turn, send an acoustic wave, see how much is coming back. This is very expensive. And no lab is able to do that today. Uh, so the, 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 the answer to your question is, if you're doing a gas turbine, you're in trouble. You have to be in a company to obtain the impedances. It's really difficult to obtain. But for, for if you're working in a lab, normally impedances, you can, you can have them. There are methods to do that with two microphones and a, loud, and a loudspeaker. If it's not turning, it's not a problem. But you have to do it. Uh, you cannot do some acoustics without measuring the dependences of your system. Coffee? <laughs> See you at 10 or 10, something like this.